everyone, I'm so excited to be here. I love the Quesa Farmers Market, and it's a perfect representation of the knowledge that's gone into this book, this food, food, great business. Um, it's a book I spent a couple of years or longer <laughs> writing, and it's with Chronicle Books, too. It's located here in the city, which is exciting to me. And it's basically, I've been working in a startup called Foodsy, helping people figure out how to sell their artisan food products online like five years ago, before it was even as big as it is now today. And um, so many people were learning the hard way, and they had all these great tips to share. And I thought, you know, there are some good books out there, and there's different websites and things, but I really wanted to write a book that answered the question, Oh, I want to bring this food product to market. What do I do now? So I ended up interviewing um, like probably 75 or so people, both people making food and experts and retailers, and trying to organize the book, which was really difficult in a linear way because, as everyone you're going to hear from here today knows, it's very non-linear the way food business works. <laughs> And it's hard to know what to do first and, you know, see, see what's going to happen and kind of shift. So I'm very excited to be with three really great Bay Area makers here. And we're going to have a conversation with them and hear about what, you know, where they came from, what they've encountered along the way and where they're going. Well, we're a farm. And uh, we were a farm for about eight years. And then, uh, and, and I, I thought I wanted a rose garden. So I went out one day and I bought 150 roses and I put in a block of roses, which is a lot to start with. And I'd never grown roses before, ever. I'm the only woman I know who didn't have at least one sad room. <laughs> so I just went out and I got 150 because I figured I need a certain amount to learn what this is about. And. And my husband right away says, well, it's taking space out of the tomatoes. You have a plan for this, right? Of course I have a plan for it. <laughs> Not really. I had zero plan for it. I just really wanted a rose garden right away. And so uh, it went really well. The roses were spectacular and beautiful. And I had all heirloom roses. So then I thought, well, I could be a bouquet maker. And I, I cut a bunch of roses and put them together into bouquets. I personally thought it was spectacular. Took them to some high-end florists who said, wow, those are really beautiful. Hey, listen, you need to strip all the leaves off. You need to strip all the thorns off. They all need to be the same height. This one's a little open, that one's a little closed. This and this are both pink, but not the same pink. So it seems so technical to make a bouquet that I just like threw in the towel immediately. Okay, I'm not cut out for this. And I just donated the roses to this meditation group that took me. Um, prayer in the hospitals, and I said, that's nice, and why don't you give us some flowers, too? So they would come and pick all the bouquets, and like that. And then a friend said to me, how about you try to make rose water, distilled rose water? You can cook those roses. Nobody's doing that around here. Why don't you try that? And that just seemed so off the wall, and unusual, and difficult, that I immediately wanted to do it. Because nobody's doing it, it's really hard, you only get a little bit, oh really? I want to try that. So so let's segue to tofu. So far it sounds like you got started organically. Now it sounds like the process of making rose water might be like making soy milk. Let's hear how you got started. Janet, I love that story because I, I was already thinking of a way to segue into that. <laughs> um, I, I think there is something to be said about doing something very difficult that nobody thinks of. Uh, but before I launch into my quick, I'm going to be very quick, my story about tofu, I want to say thank you for coming. We've been here at Hodo for a long time, and um, I'm also a board member of Cresa. And one of the things that we try to do here at Cresa is help businesses basically find ways to be innovative and to generate additional revenue. In the, at the same time being very sustainable. So because I'm a board member, believe I, because I believe in the cause, I run my business in a very similar fashion. Um, I started Auto Story 10 years ago. Um, it was very much a dream. It was very much a crazy thing to do. You know, people didn't like tofu. I love tofu. And I thought, 
you know, if I can make really good tofu, I can convince people to like it. And I'm lucky that I grew up in the Bay Area. And true enough, you know, when we make good tofu and people can taste the difference, they actually like it. So that's how we started as a company. You know, it started as sort of like a weekend warrior hobby for me. Um, while I figure out what I wanted to do at my first midlife, I'm going through my second now. Um, but essentially that's what happened. I, I wanted to prove to folks that tofu can be delicious, as delicious as the tofu that I grew up eating in Vietnam and the tofu that I grew up eating when I traveled throughout Asia. And uh, fortunately for me, I think being in the Bay Area, having rid ridden the trend of really um, food and people caring about food, were, were able to be successful uh, from that standpoint. And a lot of our success is really dependent on um, timing, hard work, um, some luck, which I'm sure you'll see in the book, but also um, the support of chefs and people who care about food and sustainable food. Um, and I'm sure you have questions later. Well, one thing, uh, a question I was going to bring up later, but I like that you listed what went into building your business. I know uh, you have a some great leaders in your company and, and you've grown and have some nice distribution and you're in Chipotle now, which is so exciting. How much would you say asking, you know, daring and just asking for what you need for funding and growth? Well, that's a great question and it's one of the things I wanted to talk about at some point too, which is, I think, I, I teach business and business operations as well and one of the things that when I tell people right away is maybe there's a hundred jams company out there but I'm never gonna say to you that don't do it so it will take some kind of huspa and, and some some courage to, to go into it you know and, and then the rest is about being smart being, pers being able to persevere um, and I do have a lot of great leaders you know at the farmers market as well as outside like here you know some of the role models that I have here, you know, Jude Taylor, Steve Sullivan of Acme Bread, Sue Connolly of Cowgirl, these are people who've gone ahead. They were, they were out there 20, 25, 30, 30 years ago. And if you talk to them, um, their companies very much are remaining in that sustainable mode. They still are the majority shareholder owner. They make great products despite the growth. And that's what we strive to do as well. You know, yes, we work with Chipotle. And the reason we work with them is because we make a great product, but also because we're a great brand, and they want to be associated with a great brand. So it's mutually beneficial, and that's what I tell people. You, you have to persevere, you have to be smart, uh, and you have to educate. That's why I'm here too. Like, I need to educate people about what to do with the tofu that I make. So, uh, Nana Despinola was started um, with a need for a breakfast that would sustain me through long surf sessions. So I started doing a little bit of research online and looking at what exactly would help with that. And I came up with fat, fiber, and protein. So I started making granola, and being Italian, I started making a lot of granola and giving it away <laughs> to uh, friends and family. And then, um, I kept giving it away, and my boyfriend finally looked at me and said, you need to sell this because I can't eat any more granola. <laughs> so, basically, I was working as a pastry chef at Nopolito, right next door to Filetti's. And I went in one day and I said, would you ever sell something that I made, like granola? And they said, yeah, we'll sell anything you make, because I used to give them free popsicles when our freezer went down. So, <laughs> that was a good one. So, I already had it in so I started doing research online. Um, this is before we had books like this and, and a lot of help that we have now. Um, so I went and got my business license. I rented some kitchen space from um, the JCC and uh, started making granola and bagging it. And it was all basically, I had no idea about packaging. I had no idea how to seal it. I just knew that this is something that I wanted to do. So. I had one flavor at the time, and I started selling it to Filetti's, and um, it kind of just started taking off from there. Um, I wanted to get into buy right, and uh, a 
series of events happened, so I decided that I wanted to just do um, Not A Joe's alone without being a pastry chef. I went home to, to Texas for um, about three months and then came back and threw myself directly into Nana Joe's and figuring out packaging, figuring out all the permits and all the fun stuff that you need to actually start a business. And with that, started doing farmer's markets right away. So it was direct sale so I could get all of the feedback. Like I had compostable biodegradable packaging at the beginning and it the granola just didn't do well in it because it's all permeable. Right now on the market, there's nobody out there that's got really great um, biodegradable compostable packaging. So um, I played that around with that. Almost dissolve. I mean, the shelf life on the packaging itself is really short. Yeah, totally. And then it was like it, it, it was like some sort of when when I bagged it and I sealed it, some sort of party happened inside where it was like a moisture party. <laughs> and I was like, why why are you saying my granola is kind of soft. It shouldn't be soft. So I started holding bags of granola and then I changed my packaging to what it almost is now, same bag as it was before. And um, kind of built that way. Started getting a little more stores, started getting braver, started walking into stores. I've never made an appointment with a buyer. I've always done cold calls. Because as soon as I get it into their hands, I just start talking. And I don't stop talking until they say, okay, I'm going to try it. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you have to be that way. You can't be scared in that manner. You have to really believe, firmly believe in everything you're doing in your, in your product. And with that, like working farmer's markets, my whole recipe changed. My whole idea of how I wanted my granola to taste, what products I wanted in there. I started getting stuff from, from the farmers more and started developing blends around what the farmers at my farmer's markets had. And I think that that was one of the ways that we really got started. Well, this is so exciting to circle back to Janet because it sounds like you started small with roses and now you have a full line of salts and sugars. How did that progress then um, from starting with roses and now you have several farm properties, right? Uh, well, yes, we started just with the location at our house of a couple acres, and then after a few years we leased 10 acres in the Casio and uh, learned how to use a tractor. And then a um, number of years after that, when <coughs> tomatoes and things froze in the Casio, we leased a piece uh, up in Petaluma and about 27 acres and we do the hot stuff up there, the basils and the uh, tomatoes and peppers and stuff, and they don't freeze up there, so it's very good. But, um, well, once I started making rose water, I had to commission someone to make a still, I had to learn how to use it, and I had to make a lot of mistakes. So, like, I just really have a heap and help and of mistakes behind every single thing I imagine that I know. For each little piece of information, it's like a whole pile of mistakes under there. So when someone's going to start, I mean, I've heard people say, I want to, but I don't know, and I'm afraid it's going to go wrong. I, I want to go, it's going to go wrong, okay? It, all the time, a, a whole bunch of things are going to go wrong. That's the process. That's not a mistake. That's how it works. I mean, all I know is the human process seems to be that we learn by making mistakes. And that, But when we want to do a business, then we don't want to make any mistakes, right? Um, oh, and also I have to say what an honor it is to be sitting here with Hodo Soy because what an outstanding product that I love, that I depend on. It's part of my health. It's part of my whole family's health. And just spectacular. I've never tried it. Oh, my goodness. I like the bouncy blocks. The big, I call them big, fluffy, bouncy blocks. Their texture, they bounce. They're just so delicious. And you should also try making tofu salad with the tofu. And you don't make tofu noodles anymore. But weren't those good? You can use the See, I don't okay. need PR. I love the Yuba. I, I know. I'm just saying. So, but it is an honor. Thank you for doing such a wonderful thing. So, Janet, all, I, I'm interested to know, I imagine being here at especially this farmer's market, you probably get lots of offers to distribute in different stores and like, how do you sort of decide what you're going to do, and do you have a vision for, like, no, wait, we want to do this, we're not doing that? Well, I like to do a little bit of retail with 
people who really curate what they do, we're in Calgary Creamery, um, that's a good reflection on me. You know, if they, if they pick me, then people who know what they do will probably take a chance on me because Cowgirl has such great taste and they're careful about every step. Um, just as far as how we went from rose water to a line of eight hydrosols, is once you have a still, you wonder what else you can put in the still. It's like that. And I've, and I've also put things in there that just like, no, no. And I didn't know how to make a rose uh, orange water. I thought, I didn't know how to make it. You can only make it with orange blossoms in case you're trying. <laughs> only with blossoms. Don't try what I do. Um, I think St. George Spirits has done the same thing with their still. It's like they just throw in fruit and try things. And <laughs> yeah. see, and a lot of things don't mistakes, but then you get a winner, you know? And then uh, we started making, then we started drying herbs. We grow a lot of herbs. And we told the uh, guys to cut a couple of pounds of Thai basil, two pounds. They cut 22. So all of a sudden I had 20 pounds of this gorgeous Thai basil. Well, mistake, but I'm not going to throw it away. And I don't know what I can do with it. So I just put it with newspapers and fans and turned it over by hand. And it dried beautifully. And so over 10 years we've gone from a table with some herbs on it to a whole drying room with a digitally controlled propane furnace and like that and because getting control of the process is really important. But here's what I want to say. If you think you have an idea about something you want to make, you should do it immediately. You should go home and you should try and make something today. Like after we talk. If you have a cuisinart and it's that kind of a thing, use your, use your kitchen tools and figure out what you're doing and give it to your friends until your friends say, you know, you got to quit giving this away. And, and then find some packaging and try it out. Because really, it's, it's fun, it's beautiful, it's creative. The world is ready for lovely tastes of great things. So tell us what, what we're sampling today. It's, so it's a Granny Smith apple from uh, Devota Orchards dipped in the All Star Organics rose petal sugar. Ooh. Another thing you can do with rose. <laughs> So Min, I'd, I'd love to hear about your growth since I live in Oakland. Um, I imagine Hodo Soy is being everywhere, but I saw you're really still on the West Coast and in some Costco and obviously Chipotle. And um, I'm curious to hear about the supply of organic soybeans and what might be down the road for delighting the rest of the nation with your soy. Well, we have... Uh a three million dollar, I mean three million square foot plant in Oakland. No, I'm kidding. Oh, I was like, wow, it seems so small. I guess Once you open the door that. and go inside, it's okay. infinite. It's like Willy Wonka. Uh, right. Uh, we are still at the same place where we started uh, eight years ago. One location. Um, somehow, through technology, we've managed to produce more tofu out of the same location. Um, we produce a lot of tofu because um, I, the part that I love most about what I do is actually the making part. Um, and we're very fortunate to have folks like Janet and you guys who do all the marketing and the sales for me. You know, so, so I, I truly am one of those blessed people who just, okay, I just need to focus on making good products and people will come and they'll spread the words and we've been very fortunate. And, and part of that is because I do tofu, you know? It's kind of unique. Most people don't try to do tofu, so that helps. So the, the, the uniqueness of the product helps a little bit. Um, we have grown quite a bit, but we've grown very sustainably. Um, in addition to using technology and designing the space to make more tofu, um, we also spend a lot of time training our employees and paying them well, giving them health insurance and promoting them. So we've grown quite a lot on that front too. And as, as, as you may know, it's one thing to build a business, it's another thing to actually get the right people to actually help you grow. And I'm inherently pretty lazy. So if I do my job well, I work myself out of a job. And that's what I tell my employees. I'm like, don't worry about your position. If you do it so well and you can work yourself, 
yourself out of this job, I'll get you another one, a different one. So that's part of the culture that really helps Hodo Story grow. And it's an important part of culture for us as a company. As far as soybeans, um, because we believe in sustainability, organic farming, we work with a cooperative in the Midwest, and they help me source organic soybeans with a lot of small farmers. And we contract all of our soybeans. So if the idea is we got to provide financial security to the small farmers if we want to encourage them to grow organic soybeans for us. And we pay about three times more uh, than conventional soybeans, and we pay a really meaningful price. Not just to the farmers, but to the co-op, which is also a nonprofit. And we use a lot of soybeans. So we'll continue to do that to promote the use uh, of organic soybeans. And I won't get into how organic soybeans is different from corn. It's not one of these, um, um, it's a legume that you can't really have contamination through genetic, like wind. You have to grow from a seed. So, so that's really beneficial for me to, to not be too concerned about contamination. And then finally, as far as what we want to do next, you know, Chipotle is a tremendous partner. It allows us to really introduce tofu to a greater public. Um, for the last two years, what we've been trying to do is um, make the product better. That's part of what I love to do. Um, without changing too much. In fact, how can you be more simple in your ingredient, yet make the products better? So that's what I try to do. And what we've done is, and you see it um, starting sort of first quarter next year, is our line of products, the ingredients have not changed at all, but we've discovered after two years a certain way of actually using sous vide technique to actually extend the shelf life but also enhance the texture. So starting first quarter of next year, instead of getting tofu that just, you know, a week or two, um, you're gonna be able to buy our tofu. It's gonna last about 45 days. And the texture is even better than what you taste now and the flavor is even more enhanced. And it's, it's through this technique that I've learned to do in the last couple of years. So that will allow us to actually sell beyond California. Um, we have a lot of interest for the last five years, but we've been growing very organically, and we don't want to just blow up, because that's just not what we do. I'm lazy, remember. So, so but starting next spring, you'll be able to see some of our products uh, going beyond California to the East Coast, because um, otherwise it's just too expensive to ship over. Before we move on, can we let Michelle tell us a little bit? about what we just passed around. It's perfect. We're moving on to her, so it's great timing. Okay, so what you're trying is uh, our, our special chef's blend series. Um, I'm a, a pastry chef, again, at, at heart, and the production kind of wears on me a little bit, and I need to go in the kitchen and do research and development and come up with new things. It's, it's kind of the way that I keep the voices in the head away. <laughs> so... Um, <coughs> This is from Brandon Jew, so he gives me a list of ingredients, and I run through the list of ingredients, and then we come up with a blend that we think suits their personality and also showcases who they are as a chef. Um, this one is uh, Chinese Five Spice that we ended up making ourselves. Uh, we didn't just go to Rainbow or, or go to a store and buy the actual Five Spice. We, we decided we wanted it a little bit um, less intense and less spicy and a little bit more fragrant um, and then it's got uh, crystallized ginger poppy seeds uh, and Santa Barbara pistachio um, Santa Barbara pistachios and candied orange peel so um, those are limited right they're limited edition we do 250 bags and then poof they're done and it's not coming back and we just handed out the second one if you want oh, to oh cool Very yeah. That's exciting. Yeah, it's really fun. So, um, yeah, definitely. I'd love to do it with you. Are you doing cool. any kind of direct to consumer subscriptions, or is that all through a buy right or no? The farmer's market? We sell at only two places at the farmer's market, or actually four. <laughs> at the farmer's market, I forget about online all the time. I'm, I'm old. <laughs> so, like, like, computer stuff to me is like, what? Um, so, we sell in good eggs. 
we sell online, we sell to buy right, and then we sell direct at the farmer's markets. Um, what you're trying now is a uh, little city gardens blend, and it's a little bit different. It's got kale, basil, hazelnuts, and um, gooseberries. And the kale and the gooseberries are grown at Little City Gardens, which is an urban garden in the Mission. And she approached me saying that she wanted to do it. And she said, I've got these gooseberries. I love your Chef Blend series. Can, can I do a blend? And I said, absolutely. So this is what we came up with. She had the gooseberries, and I said, well, if we're going to do gooseberries and it's a farm, let's throw some veggies in there. So I played around with it a little bit, and I had done a lot of uh, mint and, and kind of veggie stuff, working at Nopolito with their drinks. Um, we did a, a bergamot mint lemonade, um, kind of a mocktail, before mocktails were really mocktails. Um, so I had a lot of fun with this one, and like keeping that vibrant green color only comes from the kale being picked the day before. Otherwise, it doesn't get that super vibrant green, and it oxidizes super quick. So she picked it, I made the granola, and then that's, that's what came. We actually did this one for a holiday fair. She's having kind of like a holiday benefit fair today um, from 11 to 5 at, the, at Little City Gardens. So that's how we did that one. <laughs> and so I'm curious, you make your granola in the dog patch, right? And um, do you have thoughts that as you grow, are you going to grow into a larger facility? Or? Whoa, okay. Um, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> No, I've actually, I've been thinking about that because I'm coming up on re-signing my lease. I built out a kitchen two years ago, crossing my fingers, hoping, I actually cried all the way to signing the lease and I cried all the way home because I was like, what did I just do? I mean, what if this doesn't really work? And um, I signed a lease with a facility that I knew I could grow into. So I knew that if I, if I got this, this exact space, which is 1,884 square feet, I knew I could, I could have at least five to nine years in there. Um, right now we're a little bit maxing out on space, but it, I have 25 foot ceiling, so I can, I can grow up. Um, and we're also in the process of starting to do some crowdfunding campaigns for getting a new oven and getting some equipment so we're not constantly, like right now, um, we're hand pressing and hand cutting every single granola bar and right now we're at about 3,000 granola bars a week. So it's, it takes two hours to cut 150, so it's, it's, it's a lot. And then, so I already built it out to where I had room for another oven. Um, the hood's already extended for another oven. So I knew that if I was gonna spend the money to build it out, that I had to actually project five years down the line and see where I would be. And is that $150,000 investment of building out a kitchen out of my pocket gonna be enough for me to, to be able to pay back in a certain amount of time? And that's kind of what I did. And I was like, whoa, that's a lot of granola. So <laughs> it is, it's a whole lot of granola. But um, we've, we've slowly started adding on value added products to our line like we've got the nuts in house so why not make orange spice mixed nuts year round and only not only during the holiday and we started doing cookies which are um, vegan gluten free cookies which are like whole food cookies so there's not any of we didn't try to make it taste like anything else except what it was which is almond butter and maple syrup like snacks so and uh, I'm curious because I know you're in a building with some famous old time um, Rakuti and Kika yeah, Street. Michael Rakuti and Kika Street. Do you Streets. end up interacting with the other businesses and sharing absolutely, ideas? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So I moved into this building. Um, I had visited the American Industrial Center in the Dog Patch back in 2001 to go see Michael Rakuti because I absolutely adore making chocolate. I think it's one of the funnest things. And I'm crazy, but I like to hand table. I don't, I don't like using machines, I like to hand table. And I wanted to go see what Michael Rakuti was all about. So I went to go visit him. I was at, in culinary school at the CIA up in, in Napa, um, in St. Helena. And I fell in love with the building. And at that time, there wasn't all the food producers in there. And it was kind of, there wasn't, not every space was rented. It was mostly artists. And 
I, when I started Nana Joe's, I was like, that's where I want to move. So I, I already knew where I wanted to go, and so I, I went back and I visited, and I was like, so is there anything paid for rent? And he showed me a couple places, and neither of them really worked, and I don't think he thought I was serious. Because he was like, oh yeah, I'm a granola company, sure. And I was like, yeah, I really, really want to do this. And I've been doing it, and I'm selling a lot, and I need a bigger space, I'm in a commissary, and it's not working. I need my own space so I can ha say it's dedicated gluten-free, say you know that I've got organic stuff, and it's not cross-contaminated in the kitchen. And I'm also vegan, so, um, so it's a vegan, gluten-free, dedicated kitchen now. And that's what I really, really wanted. So talking with him, and he's like, okay, we don't have any space for you. They don't want food next to this person, and this this space isn't what you want. And there's a pillar with a leak, a water leak. And I was like, okay, I don't want that space. So I kind of gave up on it. And then I went to a party for Dandelion Chocolate because they had rented a space in there. And I met the owner again, and I met him back in 2001. I was like, oh yeah, you own the building. I'm, I'm looking for a space in here. And he goes, well, why aren't you renting? And I said, because I was told that there wasn't any space. He goes, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Let me go show you a space. And he showed me a space, and it wasn't the right fit, but two days later he called and said that somebody was giving up a space, and that's how I got in there. And going back to your question, long-winded, sorry about that, um, I talk with Jameson from Leadbetters almost daily. He, he's across the hall for me, He right? is across okay. the hall for me. Um, Brett Seriously is now next door. Um, Kika's Treats, we talk daily. We also deliver their products. We deliver um, Bread Seriously, In a Jam, and um, Kika's Treats, Mason DeMonaco. So as we were delivering around, we were all high-fiving each other, and I'm like, wait a minute, what are we doing? Why are we all driving around? Why don't we all do like a little co-op? And so five of us came together with Emmy's when it was Emmy was still owning it, um, and we decided to do a co-op and deliver for everybody, instead of everybody having to do it, to give people more time to do what they need to do to grow their business. I'm going to interject real quick, Susie, could you let Min tell us what we just served? Yes. Everybody, what oh. we just served? Sorry. Right. So this is a, a five spice tofu nuggets. Uh, it's one of our very original nuggets. Um, it's, a, it's a play on texture of tofu. So we take a firm tofu, we fry it in very light but two separate temperature to get the the water to evaporate so it becomes a sponge and then we marinate it in a five spice sauce that we make ourselves. We make all the sauces ourselves too. Um, so that's what you get. And I think there's another one. There is Thanks. right now. Awesome. I thought that was your gluten-free cookie. Oh, no. <laughs> I like I guess it's sort of organic no, looking no. Like almond butter. We have another name for it now. We can repackage that. <laughs> Tofu cookies. So, audience, one one thing I'm interested to hear, if you want to take turns shouting out different lessons you've heard these three producers as they started and grew, like what are resources they drew upon to grow their business and, and figure out what they needed to do? Co-op. What was that? Co-op. I'm doing it all by myself right now. Mm -hmm. So, using that co-op and the power of other people to deliver the product or I, I agree a hundred percent. I think your story about your group delivering together, um, I think it's critical in the beginning. Um, when I teach a class about business starting up, um, one of the things I talk about is a lot of entrepreneurs want to do a food startup. I joke that you know everybody these days want to have a food startup on their resume. And this is after you write your foam app startup, <laughs> you know? Um, but, but what I say to them is, you really need to figure out what you love. And making, if making food is what you love to do, then you need to focus on that and get the right partnership, get the right support on the other facets. You know, some people just hate finance, the number crunching part or the data part. Other people just hate <laughs> selling. They don't want to go, they're too shy to sell. So I think it's one of the things that I generally advise people is know your strengths, focus on that, and get help, you know, early on so that you don't bang your head your head against the wall when you get to the part that you didn't expect you have to do.
and one, I, I have to say my favorite part of the book is at the end, and I had so much fun doing. I'm obsessed with coffee, and I, I just thought, you know, a lot of people reading the book are going to start out thinking, oh, I want to be a coffee roaster and package the coffee, and I have to sell it in Whole Foods. And it's like, well, what do you, what do you really get out of being in coffee? And these are all, you know, the, I made a big list of all the ways you could be in coffee, and it might not be that particular thing. Maybe you want to have a little cart, or you know, you want to just sell wholesale and have more flexibility. So Janet, I'd love to, we've heard some great examples of collaboration. I know you have the business with your husband, Marty. What what feeds your souls about your business and your farm life, and, and how does collaboration fit into your business? Well, um, well, we just really like to do it. We're plant people. We garden before we farm, so our farm's like big garden, and it's just what we like. If you like plants, you know, you're going to go in that direction. And uh, collaboration, well, one of the first things was Calgary Creamery, honestly. Those people not only have done a wonderful job of building their own business, but they've also helped more people than you can count either you know encourage them yes go ahead and make that cheese and don't worry just do it if you can do it we will sell it I mean that kind of encouragement you know and they call I I uh, it came to the point where you know I, I'd been doing this for a little while I only had three things I had garlic salt rosemary salt and lavender salt I only had three things and um, and so I quit my job and I thought, oh, the farm will take care of us and this can grow. And I took all my courage and I called, because I knew Sue, and I called Sue and I, and I said, I was thinking of Alice Medrick, you know who she is. She started Coca Lot, right? And I saw her do a little talk once and she said, I'm going to show you how not to go to a customer. <laughs> That this is how I went to a customer the first time. I had truffles on a little tray. I went to the back door. The person opened the door. I held up the tray, but I didn't make eye contact. I kept my face down, and I said, you wouldn't want to buy any truffles, would you? And I thought, okay, if I can do better than that. Um, but I was almost that way, you know. You, would, you wouldn't want to buy any. And Sue and Peggy gave me an order, like a real order, that, that I go, I got to get back to you. Because they ordered more than in my wildest dreams. I, never, I thought, oh, a few jars of this and a few jars of that. They ordered cases and cases. I had to actually rearrange the furniture just to, in my workshop. I got to think bigger to put this order out, you know, so like that, it, right from the beginning. They helped me. And, and do you know what? That's the same exact story Rustic Bakery told me that's in the book. And talked about how that happened with, with Cowgirl Creamery. And that's how they got started. And they're like, this is a sign. You know, they're like, the time is right. Get started and then go for it. And um, there's a lot of examples in the book as far as like signs and synchronicity and talking to people and following your gut. I mean, that's... And so also a website. And, and you mentioned a website, you know, and I and I don't always think of it, but um, so I had these two products and almost the third one, almost garlic salt, and out of nowhere, we got a call, and the person says, "Hi, I'm from NBC Today Show, and we'd like to feature your products on our Christmas thing." And I thought I was going. I can't say no, <laughs> but I can't say yes. So I went, okay, and she says, and I need your website. And I said, we don't have a website. She said, what? <coughs> well, if you want to be on the Today Show, better get yourself a website. You have two weeks. So, okay, I have two weeks to do that and figure out how I really want to make garlic salt, because I haven't got that figured out either. But I said yes. So we're laying in bed the day it's supposed to be on TV, right? The day show comes on like at 3 o'clock, our time, on the East Coast. We're laying in bed, but I left the computer on, and it goes ding. I went, oh. It goes ding, 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 
And then we had to wait till 6 o'clock for it to get to our us, right, where we can see it. But every time it went through a time zone, the computer went insane. I'm not kidding. And, the la and so we got like 500 orders in 24 hours, which before that, previously in 24 hours, one would have been our record. One order. So then it was like all the neighbors and all their kids and let's have a rapping party. But say yes. And then stretch. You know what I'm saying? Rise to meet the opportunity. Don't say I'm not ready. Just figure it out. So I love these stories. Okay, each talk about a mistake you made and a lesson you learned from it. Or something great that might have happened from it. Briefly. Um, definitely briefly. Um, so my biggest mistake was a, a packaging mistake. I hired somebody on and after about the first week or two when we were talking, um, I thought it was a great fit. And then two months down the road, I knew it wasn't the right fit, but I didn't know how to get out of it and I was afraid to be like, this isn't, this isn't what I want, this isn't working, this isn't my vision, and I kept being told I would be laughed out of my industry if we put that on your packaging. So my advice about my biggest mistake is listen to what's inside of you, because what's inside of you really does know what's right and what's wrong. And I think things would have been a little bit differently if I would have listened to my instincts to begin with. Um, and don't ever let anybody bully you because it's your business and that's super important. With pricing, with anything, somebody comes to you and says, you've got to drive your price to $6 or we're not going to put it in our store. I can't do that, but you've got to. I can't do that. You have to stay firm with that because you'll sink your ship faster than it can even sail. Advice. Um, I, I think for me, one of the mistakes that I remember among many is um, at one point when we were growing pretty quickly, a couple of years back, we hired what I call a professional. <laughs> because until that point, and even today, I joke that we really don't have any professionals in our company. Everyone who comes through there are, have two qualities one is hardworking, and two is smart and then we teach them and then we imbue the culture that we want for them to basically follow um, and when we hire a professional who knew exactly what he was doing this guy really knew everything but he was a terrible cultural fit and he drove everyone else insane and we had to let him go because of that so that was one of the biggest lessons I learned is you know None of us have really massive companies. When you have massive companies, um, someone who's not a cultural fit may not matter so much. But if you're growing a, a small company, um, getting the right people to fit culturally um, with your vision and the integrity of your culture, that's really critical. And not to mention the money you're spending on this person who's not a good fit. <laughs> yeah. Gee, I don't know. I'm, I'll tell you, all I'm thinking of is um, thinking that all herbs drive the same, <laughs> you know, or, or that drying peppers is going to be just the same as drying tomatoes. It's not. Um, I think I've made some... So I guess what comes up for me when you say mistakes is things I actually had to throw away. It's very practical and like, oh, that's, a, you know. But, but, um... I don't know. How else are you going to learn? You know, how else are you going to learn? Everybody, some, some of the biggest things have turned into big opportunities for us that we would never have gone that way or never met that person or tried to do that thing um, if it hadn't been some mistake at the beginning. You can't make bouquets. That led to rose water. That led to hydrosol. Um, Dry, cut too many herbs, that led to how you dry this, I'm not throwing it away, to, hey, this is better. These dried herbs I just made from a mistake are better than anything I'm buying in the store. Look at the color, look at the fragrance, look at the texture. I would never get anything like that in the store. And I would always buy my herbs from, like, the Good Earth, Organic, really best stuff I could find. But once I started doing my own, Honestly, I started going, how old is that stuff I'm buying? 
because you know what? It's not like this. And I thought there's just got to be more people like me who want to have something special. And it's just herbs and just salt and just spices. So it's a little bit of something really special that really does what you want it to do. There's got to be more. Trust your taste. If you're doing something and you love it, you know what? The whole world doesn't have to love it. It's a big world. There'll be people who do, who <laughs> like your taste, who are into what you're doing, who want to get behind you. You know, it doesn't, it's seven billion people or whatever. They don't all have to like it. Just a little few have to like it for you to get started. And they will. And they will. If you love it, other people will too. Sounds like going with the flow has been your big lesson as far as shifting and just following the direction and opportunities that come and up. Customers give yeah. their best ideas. Mm -hmm. your customers. So, I love dipping walnuts in your rose sugar. That's my idea. I have a last question, and this question is for you as the author of this book and as someone who advises new businesses. What's next? What, what would be a good way to kind of engage further and learn more and, and start your own business or develop, you know, further develop your own business. I'm developing a companion e-course to go with the book that's like going to be like a chapter by chapter where there will be a community of people and you can plan along with the book and go out and do assignments and research and try things and come back and have people around you to bounce ideas off of. and. I've done that before with other topics, and I think it's a really fun way to learn and a fun way to get started. And even people who may not be serious about starting a food business, but it's like, I just want to see. Um, I'm going to make it affordable enough that the casual foodie will be able to do that and at least learn really what goes into the foods that you spend so much money on and that you love and all the people you support because it, it takes so much. And, Ingredients are expensive, and you'll learn all about how to make the most of whatever you invest in the business you're thinking of starting.